We continue reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. <clears throat> That's really a very um, interesting way to start. But first, um, I am less organized than I thought I was. How do I make it go to the next one? There we go, there we go. When we were planning our wedding in 1975, Tom's dad, our coach for all things liturgical and churchy, suggested that we use a portion of today's reading from Romans as the theme for our special day. Starting with Romans 6, 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that we too might walk in the newness of life. Wow, it was really a cool idea, we thought. Life would be new for us once we were married. So Tom and I had a college friend who was an artist and we asked him to design um, our wedding invitations and the cover for the bulletin using newness of life as the really cool theme. And this is what he designed for us. We liked the artwork very much. But you know, after the wedding, we didn't really think much about walking in newness of life. We were already in a new life. But it is time to think about it. As I started to prepare this message, I asked myself what this newness of life is, really. What does it look like? I thought about nature, spring, this beautiful season, that we waited for all winter long. The earth is transformed from dirty white snow and brown trees to green grass and blooming flowers and new leaves on the trees and warm weather. Then there is the transformation that happens when a baby is born, um, at graduations, at weddings, at retirement, in new homes. These could also be called newness of life. And there's recovery from devastating illness and recovery from chemical addiction. These experiences change a person. He or she, we hope, experiences a radical transformation from the old to the new life. But it's more, there's more to it than that, although perhaps we're getting closer. So here's the whole passage that was appointed for today from Romans 6. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? No means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we had, have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. 
For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the word of the Lord. So I had to do a little bit of um, study with this, because Paul starts, what then shall we say? And I think about his opening words to the Galatians. Uh, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has, um, help me, who has bewitched you or something like that. Well, he starts out with this, what then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. So when you see exclamation points with Paul, you got to go back and see why. So chapter 6 is a correction or a clarification of something from chapter 5. Did you preach on chapter 5 yes, last week? You, you know, okay. <laughs> where, of chapter 5 where Paul writes, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The more you sin, the greater the grace that God offers, the more God will forgive you. It's like thinking, hey, I love to sin, and God loves to forgive, so this is a swell arrangement. It's like taking advantage of God's forgiving heart while not bothering to make any changes in our own behavior. Most winters when I was a kid, my dad would make an ice rink on one side of our house so that we would go outside and play and ice skate. My sister and I came up with all sorts of fancy moves that we thought were quite spectacular, and we called one parent or the other to come watch our great talent. We were good skaters. One day, I tried to get my mom's attention. She was in the house. I wanted her attention and her accolades by... (laughs) I got her attention by throwing a snowball at the back door. The window broke. (laughs) I didn't realize that the snowball was mostly ice. My dad was too pleased, but I really didn't get in trouble. At supper that night, I asked what it meant to take something for granted. I'd heard that phrase and I'd picked it up somewhere. And he scowled at me. The back door, he said. You took it for granted that I would fix it without tanning your hide. Oops, he was right. The assurance that I would be forgiven by my parents didn't make me think before I did something really dumb. It meant I could have a cavalier attitude about breaking that window. What then are we to say? Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means, no way. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Almost 20 years ago, O Brother, Where Art Thou was released. It's a movie. Has has anybody seen it? Uh, We watch it regularly at our house. It's a retelling of Homer's ancient classic, The Odyssey. The three main characters have broken out of jail in Mississippi in the days of the Depression. And in this clip I'm going to show you, Everett, Pete, and Delmar are hiding in the woods when all these singing people dressed in white come out of nowhere and they go down to the river and so the three men follow. Delmar, insane. Well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting's my reward. Delver, what are you talking about? We got bigger fish to fry. The preacher said all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. Well, I was lying. 
And the preacher said that that sin's been washed away too. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. If anyone was looking for newness of life, it was good-hearted Delmar and then cranky Pete. Everett, who was played by George Clooney, was the instigator of their lawless living, and he thought this was all funny. Delmar talks about walking the straight and narrow from now on, and even though he delighted in the knowledge of God's forgiveness, he kept following Everett through their continued misadventures, stealing cars, all sorts of things. There really wasn't any straight and narrow for him. But are we any different? Now I have another question about newness of life. If we are walking in newness of life, does that mean we have to be perfect? I don't want to preach that. I don't want to tell you that you have to be perfect because I know how far from perfect I am, even when I think I'm a pretty good person. I'm unsettled by this idea. Nowhere in this reading does Paul say anything about our stumbling as we try to walk in the newness of life, or even deciding to take a walk off to the side altogether here now and then. We live in a world where sin is still with us, even as we are living a new life. Sin remains a constant threat, even as we are God's children. Delmar eventually found that out. There is no newness of life without Christ walking with us, holding our hands and showing us the way. But maybe we should think of walking in newness of life in a different way. And for this, I thank Tom, because we talked about this as we walked around the neighborhood yesterday. Maybe it's not something we do, but rather a state of being. It's who we are because, our, because of our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection. Newness of life is all around us, even in the dead of winter. Jesus brought us into newness of life as water was splashed around us, and the minister said those words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Maybe instead of saying we walk in newness of life, we could say we have become part of it. And since we are part of this newness of life, we are freed from the worry about what we can do to get ourselves on God's good side or what we can do to get into heaven. We're freed from the worry about what we can do to keep ourselves on that straight and narrow. God says, I've got this. Quit worrying about saving yourself. I've already done that. Now you use your freedom to take care of one another to make Use it to make the world a better place for everyone. And in doing so, in some very mysterious way, we become partners with God. Next picture. This is a jack pine tree. When Jesus... I'm getting ahead of myself now. When Jesus redeemed us from sin, death, and the powers of evil, he also redeemed all of creation. We see evidence of creation being part of Christ's newness of life right now in the growing grass, which, of course, we have to cut. Um, the sprouting seed, seeds, the budding trees, the blooming flowers. Right now, we're in the middle of it, and we treasure it, but there is more to Christ's newness of life and creation than the wonders of spring. And here is an example. Jack pine trees uh, grow in Canada and the eastern United States, and they're humble masters of newness of life. They're not typically long-lived trees like the majestic white pines that were almost lumbered out of existence, but they are still a mysterious sign of the newness of life. Jack pines bear cones that are closed up 
tight. They don't even look like pine cones, do they? The cones fall off, the trees still tightly bound, and they don't open to expose the, expose the seeds until there is a fire. And when fire comes, the cones pop open, and the seeds are distributed throughout the forest. And miraculously, they don't burn up. Depending on the air temperature, the seeds could germinate in that sooty soil in as few as 10 days. New little trees can grow quickly, around two feet each year. There's newness of life built into jack pine trees, and they are a part of it. And remarkably, jack pines do not bring new life to the forest just for their own existence. Kirkland, Kirtland, war, I keep wanting to say warriors, Kirtland warblers themselves close to extinction, shelter and nest under jack pine trees. Jack pine forests are being carefully stewarded by Kirtland enthusiasts so that the birds can thrive and increase in number. And blueberries. For some reason, newness of life reason, blueberry bushes grow well under that canopy of the jack pine trees. It's a bonus, newness of life. Now, we were way young when we got married, maybe too young to see the rich depth of walking um, in new life, new life with Christ. But growing in years and wisdom are also part of the newness of life given to us by Christ. Perhaps it would be good to have the wedding design somewhere in our home where we could look at it more often and think about that new life. So let's pray. Oh God, your costly grace is no excuse for dwelling in sin. Therefore, strengthen us to do what is favorable in your sight for the benefit of your kingdom's growth. In him who gives us new life. Amen.